Good evening, everyone. My name is Olivia Obinamend. I am the Manager of Partnerships and Local Content at the Better Government Association. On behalf of the BGA and the Chicago Tribune, I want to welcome you to the Failures Before the Fires event, examining a broken oversight system. This event is, first, is, our, is our first designed to share with you deeper insight into the BGA and Chicago Tribune's exploration of 42 fatal fires in Chicago residential buildings, where the city knew of fire safety hazards, but did not crack down on landlords in time. The results of this investigation were published last month. A link to re the report can be found in the Q&A on the Zoom and in the chat on Facebook. Tonight, you'll hear investigative reporters Madison Hopkins of the BGA and Cecilia Reyes of the Chicago Tribune in conversation with panelists Eric Patton-Smith, Mark Lamani, and Greg Miao. Following their discussion, we'll open the conversation for questions and then provide you with a survey before closing out with final thoughts from our panelists. Please place your questions in the Q&A field if you are watching on Zoom or in the chat if you are joining us on Facebook. Also know a rec video recording of this event will be available in English and with Spanish closed captioning later this week. It will be shared with all registered attendees as well as through Chicago Tribune and Better Government Association channels. Now let's introduce our reporters. Madison Hopkins is an investigative reporter for the Better Government Association. She received her master's degree from the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University in August 2016. At the BGA, she has written stories about the failures of Chicago's recycling program, regulatory enforcement at statewide nuclear plants, and more. Cecilia Reyes is a reporter on the Chicago Tribune's investigations team and has written about water affordability and homelessness. Originally from Mexico, she is interested in issues of housing and social justice. Madison and Cecilia. So I should say, uh, thank you, Olivia. And uh, thank you all to our panelists for being here and for the audience for coming out to be a part of this event tonight. Um, we got started with this project after the horrible little village fire in 2018 on this devastating loss of 10 children. It came out in the immediate aftermath that city officials knew of these fire safety problems at the property, like missing smoke detectors and blocked egress for years. And we wondered how could that happen? And in how many other fires were there early warning signs that could have been prevented? And when we dove into it, we found these widespread failures of the city's system to set up to keep people safe in buildings. And the toll was tremendous. With, like Olivia mentioned, with at least 61 people dying in these fires. And we're gonna get into some of the major issues at play here, but before we do, we're gonna show a brief video that highlights some of what we uncovered. We still have uh, people reported trapped on the third floor that we can't get to. What's on fire? A building? Chicago Fire Department. It's fire. A fire. Oh, the building is burning. Sir, please tell us to get out. That is still in our apartment. Mark England died in a single family home the city knew was illegally converted into a boarding house. There were too many bedrooms and not enough exits. Sarah Amon died in an abandoned building so dangerous that it was ordered torn down but the city didn't follow through. Four of Shemaya Coleman's children died in a building where the city failed to force landlords to fix serious fire hazards. I love my mark with dirty red. <laughs> a recent investigation by the Better Government Association and the Chicago Tribune identified 61 people who died in fires after government officials were warned about fire safety issues. The city failed to hold landlords accountable to fix the dangerous problems in time. We found that hundreds of 311 complaints about these unsafe buildings were never fully investigated. And even when inspectors did document fire safety hazards, we found the city's process for holding landlords accountable isn't working. Landlords were allowed to delay fixes, cases were closed without verifying repairs, hearing officers let landlords off the hook with warnings or small fines. Follow-up was often too little, too late. 
The fires were concentrated in poor, disinvested areas, and the majority of the people who died in these unsafe homes were black. They were put in danger by a failed system that routinely puts the interests of property owners above the safety of tenants. Bottom line, their government failed to protect them. Hi everyone, um, my name is Cecilia again with the Chicago Tribune. Um, thanks again, like Madison mentioned, for making it to this virtual event. Um, like she was mentioning, when we were delving into how often the city knew of issues before fatal fires, um, it required you know, a, a large amount of research that kind of goes beyond the individual fire event. Um, and it's for that reason that we want to have um, this conversation that is gonna be touching on various aspects um, of what the investigation is about. So I just wanna introduce our three panelists, starting with Eric Patton-Smith, uh, who is a lifelong Southside resident and an activist for housing safety. After a fire killed his daughter, Ariana, in an unsafe apartment building, he pushed Chicago aldermen to hold landlords more accountable. The city council passed an ordinance in 2015 based on his proposal, creating a list of problem landlords who would be barred from most city contracts until repairs were made. Joining us also is Mark Lamani, a former attorney who spent 26 years as a litigator and legal advisor to the city of Chicago on its building, fire, zoning, and health codes. This includes his tenure as general counsel to the Chicago Department of Buildings, where he directed the regulatory review division, oversaw the licensing division, and served as a legislative liaison to the city council. We'll also be hearing from Greg Miao, who is a senior attorney at Change Lab Solutions. He works on legal issues related to healthy housing, water quality, and other topics. Prior to joining Change Lab Solutions, Greg worked on developing regional cooperative agreements in the Boston area with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council and represented several Massachusetts communities as a municipal attorney. I wanna thank all of you um, for joining us and I wanna hand it off to Madison for the first question. Yeah, so like Olivia mentioned, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end, but just to kick us off here, um, we would like to hear from each of our panelists about if they if you learned anything unexpected through this process. So either during our previous interviews or after reading the finished project, project or just with your general experience with building code enforcement in Chicago, has anything struck you as surprising or not in line with your previous understanding of how the city operates when it comes to building code enforcement? Maybe we'll go to uh, you first, Mark. You're on mute. You gotta. There you go. Have we got? There we go. Um, yeah. Sadly, I would say that uh, uh, past being prologue, as the old saying goes, uh, there's not a lot of surprises in the the difficulties and problems and the repetitive nature of the fire uh, disasters that have occurred in the city's uh, history. Uh, the city has an excellent fire department. It is an outstanding. Uh, uh, agency, but uh, it's difficult for them to do routine inspections. That, uh, that obligation rests with the building department process. And uh, I think that's where a lot of the, the difficulties and the repetitive nature of these disasters has uh, uh, been uh, foisted upon the city. Mm -hmm. Eric? Well, in my take, I mean, yes, we do have an excellent fire department here in Chicago. I will never speak ill of them, but our city doesn't use its resources. As Mark was saying, the builders department's claims that they don't have enough resources to investigate. We have safe passage workers that have cleared all basic city standards that could be trained to go around to the areas they're already working and do the investigations. But we're gonna put it on the call in. How many tenants living in a residential building actually get to see the basement to know that there's a violation down there? Mm -hmm. So if we're waiting on the call in from areas that's not seen from tenants, we're just putting them in more trouble, prolonging and doing what we've been doing, nothing. It's interesting that the whole 
you know, for reference for the audience, the whole process in Chicago in for building code enforcement is primarily based on 311 complaints. So that, you know, is an issue we've raised. And Greg, you know, from your perspective of somebody who's not a Chicagoan is coming at this from a, so studying this at a very high level and looking at it other areas, you know, what was your take on uh, the project and the issues identified? Yeah, I think um, I'll have to join in with Mark and say, unfortunately, I don't think it's all that surprising given the system that's in place. Uh, as you said, we work on this at a high level and you know, ultimately what we have here is our, our system failures that are putting people at risk. Um, you know, how much are we expecting that our tenants will know what fire code is, what the right fire hazards are, um, you know, ultimately putting the pressure on them or the responsibility on them to pursue a sort of remedy is probably not going to result in good outcomes. Uh, and we've seen that not just in Chicago, I'll say that, you know, this is probably something that's um, happening across the country where there are complaint-based systems. You know, our tenants just aren't well informed enough and it's a lot to ask for them to be, to be able to you know, make the, their complaints, let alone, you know, get over any fears they might have of uh, engaging with the complaint system um, relative to landlord retaliation or, you know, other interactions with government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting um, thing to get into because, so this project really was about um, examining like all of the fires that occurred in Chicago uh, from 2014 to 2019, um, but it overarchingly is really about housing safety and like how do we ensure that people are living in safe homes. And one of the questions that I um, would like Mark to um, answer or to at least, you know, pose um, some information for the audience is like how or like what the city perceives are its biggest challenges in ensuring that buildings are safe and how that differs for owner occupied homes and rental homes and obviously I know you're not speaking for the city uh, but just in in the time that you were with them like what would you say the main differences were in those two categories well um my uh, recollection of the building department and the, the, the issue is really in terms of manpower. Uh, the building department has a tendency to be listed as a lower priority uh, um, service uh, while everybody expects it, its ability to be able to, to find all the code violations and to honor all the, the cold calls that come in from the public at large when there's a problem. It's a tendency to uh, have insufficient uh, manpower to, to pursue particular landlords who haven't been responsive to these conditions and leaving behind hazards that are a threat to the, to the residents. Um, uh, there are union related issues which are uh, complicating to the problem because the unions are a very strong and powerful uh, and, and vibrant part of the city's uh, 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 activities. But at the same time, the question is how do we make sure that we're not dropping a stitch when we're facing uh, conditions that are unfathomable? Un, uh, and, and what would you say is like the main difference between ensuring safety in homes when it comes to owner occupied versus rentals? Well, rentals provide uh, a generally a, a, a bigger problem because uh, there is a rotation in the ownership and, uh, and people will move in and move out of homes quite frequently. Uh, and the end result of that is that uh, uh, people aren't paying attention, particularly the landlords aren't paying attention to the, the repairs that have to be routinely made. Uh, we still have an ongoing problem where people do not have smoke detectors available for each and every uh, unit. And uh, uh, when we do have a problem, we are very slow in the mechanics of getting enforcement in the administrative hearings process or in the court litigation process. Um, oh, go ahead, Eric. No, I just wanted to, um, like you said, you know, they're saying that they don't have, well, the Builders Department don't have adequate resources. And 
it's more of I wonder if the police may use that. Not, nothing against you, Mark. You're not there, but I wonder if the police use that as an excuse for murders. Would Mr. Brown still have his job? You know, just saying, well, I don't have the resources to catch the murderers. It, it has to be an attempt, a valid, wholehearted attempt. And the fact that it is, like he said, as renters, I can't speak from a homeowner perspective, but as renters, when we, when I, when me and the city council, the, the city put the uh, Ariana ordinance, to, Ariana Patterson, Coleman Kids ordinance together, I thought we were going to make progress. I mean, you know, why can't a building be sold if we already know that it that doesn't pass inspection? The inspection should be made to be passed before the sale. The building department controls the sale, correct? That's correct. Okay. I just, you know, it, it's just like, I don't see any, by, I, and the comment made by the county's, I mean, the building department's head said, you know, well, hey, we can't be responsible for everything, anybody going anywhere. I, I, I kind of understand it, but it shows the attitude of our city uh, government that, hey, you know, if why bother trying if I can't be perfect? You know, oh, go ahead, sir. Uh, it, it does seem that the problem frequently is a, a lack of resources and a, a lack of commitment towards devoting the funds and the material and the the inspectional uh, uh, support staff that is required to cover the city. Cities are pretty massive uh, places. You can obviously know everybody. Ch city of Chicago has a long and storied history with fire and fire safety conditions. But the problem, I think, is that uh, there is such a, a challenged budget that it is impossible, at least from what I see, to be able to finance the investments that are necessary to capture more uh, the conditions of the problems that are of the buildings that are the worst. And, and while I, I'm just, I was just going to actually say, you know, Mark, with your experience, you know, we have so many years with the city. Have you seen those issues ebb and flow at all? Has, uh, has there been a time when they've done more with less, so to say, when they've utilized those resources differently? Sadly, no. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, as the decades roll by, nothing seems to fully change. We have... Uh, periods of time when in the face of a disaster, we, we rally the, the resources for a period of time. But as other demands are necessary for police and the fire departments and all the, the, the various uh, agencies and arms of the city of Chicago, uh, fire safety tends to be uh, something that is visited after a disaster, as opposed to preemptively to to catch the, the conditions and re remedy the conditions before uh, we're, we're back to a, a safe state. Yeah, I think preemptive is an interesting word, uh, which makes me wanna go to Greg and ask, you know, how have other cities dealt with this problem of we only have so much to go around? And, or, or how have you seen that play out in places that are deciding to change the way they go about ensuring safety in homes? Yeah, um, so we see that there's a number of cities that have tried to take a more proactive approach. Um, there's a lot of different ways that they, these have been called systemic code enforcement, proactive code enforcement, um, a couple of other terms get thrown around. But generally what they're trying to do is flip the script from a 311 or a complaint based enforcement system where a tenant makes a complaint to the city and the city goes out and does a responsive inspection um, to something where they are one inventorying all of the rental properties in the city upfront through either like a rental registration or a rental licensing program. Uh, and then they're going out and they basically establish a schedule uh, and then selection criteria for you know going out and inspecting those properties. So that, that varies a lot um, based on location and based on the type of rental stock and the, the primary in sort of reason behind passing it. So some of these programs have been uh, stood up as responses to lead poisoning crises in uh, you know, children in their, in their cities. Uh, others have been stood up in response to you know, unsafe conditions, which might include you know, falls and 
uh, fire safety. Um, and, and there's a number of other reasons why these can get stood up. Um, but, you know, I was just looking at a, a survey where we're doing some research right now on, um, you know, who all has these. And it, it's, it's a bit hard. Obviously, there's a lot of cities and towns across the country. So it, it's hard to get a comprehensive list. But for instance, you know, there's roughly about uh, half of the, the, you know, 20 of the 50 largest cities in the country have some form of proactive code enforcement program. Um, some examples, you know, include Boston and Seattle, but also um, Houston um, and, and a few others. So um, there, there are out there and what these places are doing is that they're, they're essentially gathering information around what, what is their rental stock, who are their landlords. And then on a generally like a three to five year basis, they're subjecting rental units to a um, you know, recurring um, inspection program. Um, the, the last thing I'd say is, you know, cause I think it's been mentioned by Eric and, and Mark about the difficulty of sort of enforcing, um, you know, bringing enforcement actions against people, you know, or landlords where there are code violations found is that, um, you know, a lot of these proactive code enforcement programs really are tied to uh, different sort of policy levers, whether they're like certificates of occupancy um, or other things that really are essentially, you know, essential for landlords to be able to operate their business. Um, and when the violations are found, um, it gives a lot of these cities very big sort of sticks that they can wield to say, hey, if you're not, if you don't bring this into up to code, we're going to revoke your license to essentially lease this property. Um, and, you know, that's a big financial incentive for landlords to bring, you know, their properties into compliance. I mean, something I found interesting and when we were speaking with you in the past about proactive rental inspections, some of the programs is this idea of um, essentially triaging landlords in a way of the properties that have a history of violations might be inspected more frequently and those that get a clean pass on the first one might have a little bit more time before they need to do another inspection. And it's actually similar to the proposal or the ordinance that Eric was mentioning that he proposed and worked to get passed through city council. And I was wondering, Eric, if you could maybe just recount a little bit for us about what that process was like for you and how you came up with the idea to target landlords in this way? Well, I had just lost my daughter and basically sleep wasn't an option. My mind was everywhere. So the pain I was feeling, I basically could honestly say I wouldn't want my worst enemy to feel. So it became a thought in my mind of, you know, I lost my little girl like this. I remembered another fire that happened around the corner on, on 112th and King Drive where a little girl died. And I'm like, this is happening way too frequently. You know, so I looked into the, I looked at what I saw in my neighborhood and around my area. I actually came up with uh, sort of like the fire department in Chicago uses X's to mark uh, dilapidated buildings. I actually came up with a system that was color coded to show what level the um, building was at, which would give incentive to the neighbors to frequently call 311 and city services if I have a building that's dropping my property value. It gives them an incentive to save their own as well as helping the community. That was fought hard by the retail association where, I mean, the uh, renters association where we had to drop, I had to drop that from it. And they basically, I fought for everything I could, but basically it, now, now it feels empty. But at the time I thought we came up on something because we said we were gonna stop slumlords from being able to get uh, city contracts that would expose their complete portfolio to the judges they were in front of and it was supposed to be a great thing as well as it was supposed to have the MTRO contact tenants and explain to them their options when they were living in a slumlord building. I never seen that come to fruition. So it was a lot of things that was supposed to do that just seemed like it got passed, it got printed, but it never, just the list came out. Everything else was just like background. 
Right. And for reference for the audience, what he's speaking of is what Eric's initial proposal was, what it kind of got turned into through the city government was the problem landlord list, which was um, a plan to essentially, the city was saying it was going to make a list of the worst offenders, repeat offender landlords, and publish them to give tenants you know, information in that way. But we found during the investigation that the city quickly abandoned even you know, that process right after adopting it. Um, but they're, they're recently announced, so they're trying to revamp it and bring it back. We're gonna see how that goes, but it's still based on this idea of collecting information about the worst landlords so that they can get the extra scrutiny, which we know from other cities when we've been speaking about this aspect of data collection can be really important and really powerful tool. Um, you know, either Mark or Greg, do you want to take this? I wonder if you can talk about how record keeping can play a role here. Sure, I'll hop in real quick. Um, so we've recently been, uh, we wrote a, a sort of a guide on proactive code enforcement a few years ago, and we've actually been in the process of updating it. And I make mention of that just to, to say, I've been talking to a lot of heads of code enforcement divisions across the country recently. And one of the things we routinely hear from, from everyone who has this essentially is that there is a lot of value to building a database of rental properties in, in the community. Um, there's a few different things. One, um, it's just good for the city to know. It's, it's surprising a lot of, you know, most cities are reliant on using sort of American community survey data to try to estimate how many rental properties there are in the city. The fact of the matter is that there's, most cities have no comprehensive list of the, the properties or what the properties are being used for. Um, and so it becomes really hard to target programming and to figure out sort of are there neighborhoods that need extra service and extra attention? Are there particular types of properties that are contributing to particular types of harms that our residents are facing? So for example, we know we're led, right? That um, the lead, lead, lead laws are, uh, we didn't update them until and ban lead, uh, lead paint until 1978. So where is your pre-1978 housing? Who's being exposed to that type of um, you know, risk? Um, and so the, the data, you know, building these databases is really important because it helps sort of disaggregate and tease out all of the different risks and harms that our residents are facing. Uh, and it, it can really is very, can be used very powerfully uh, with planners and other folks to sort of understand both sort of the, the scope of exposure and an environmental harm and risk that some of our residents are facing, um, as well as identifying Sort of what are the right types of interventions or how should the city be focusing um, its resources. Uh, the last thing I want to add here though is, is the, the sort of secondary benefit which is just communication with landlords uh, and this is something that came up a lot actually just in light of the COVID pandemic um, you know as cities were trying to pass you know pass housing protections and uh, get word out to landlords and residents you know, developing these databases means you have contact information for all the landlords, and it really does change the dynamic um, that a lot of these cities have had with their landlords, which often was pretty antagonistic. We're coming in, we're enforcing our code violations against you, to, you know, one where they're having routine communication with landlords. They're often having, like, landlord seminars on a yearly basis to, to teach the landlords about what their codes are and what their responsibilities are. And it really does create a new dynamic and opportunity for, you know, in an emergency situation like we just, you know, have been going through to be able to get more information out to landlords and therefore tenants um, in a much more comprehensive and widespread way. And so we are hearing from a lot of them that, you know, building these databases is, is not just about the data, but it's actually, there's a relationship that you gets developed through that too. Um, and that can really be a powerful thing, maybe not for working against those who are the most repeat violators, but if we can raise the base level of, um, of our housing stock and we can improve most landlords' uh, responsibilities and how they're doing their upkeep, that's gonna be really protective for a lot of folks. Yeah, th thanks for that. Um, 
Yeah, I, I will add, by the way, that definitely we'd, we've had to rely on census data for knowing anything about how many rental units, and it would be great if we actually knew how many there were in the city of Chicago. Um, there is, you know, this whole conversation around data collection and having robust data um, can also go a different way, um, which is that as part of the investigation, narrowing in on the 42 cases where there were known issues before the fires kind of begs the question, like the Department of Buildings knew about certain problems, like inspectors had been out there, they had seen it, you know, that data existed, so, so to speak. Um, so I guess the, the problem would seem to be that there's a lack of follow-up once things are found. Um, and I know, Mark, you were mentioning that there's this issue of uh, resources and how you allocate people and what you can do um, is limited by how much you have to spend. But I wonder, is there something else that the city could be doing that, that's not incumbent upon you know, getting more money about enforcement of, of its codes and of issues that it does find and document? Uh, well, in my experience, there, there is the, the will to do this, but the problem is strictly an issue of the cost. The city, uh, uh, many, many years ago, approximately 25 years or so ago, went to an administrative enforcement process where the effort was really around imposition of financial fines. Uh, earlier in the years, you know, when I practiced law at the, the building department, we would actually hear dramatically large numbers of cases. But in each of those instances, the landlord had to appear in the courthouse have to work with the building inspectors directly with the prosecutor in the wings. And they would come up with remedies that were within uh, the guidelines of the municipal code of making sure that the buildings were restored. Uh, now we're very, uh, uh, we're not as proactive, we're much more reactive to the conditions that have happened out there. And the sad thing for me is to see that the fires that have been happening you know, for the history of Chicago continue to occur, but without uh, 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 getting to the end of the, of the, of the queue. And uh, I don't think there's really uh, uh, sufficient funds don't, committed to the building department and the inspection departments and, and the fire department as well, which has inspectional uh, responsibilities for certain types of buildings. Uh, really don't get the kind of enforcement support that is necessary to fund effectively the, the, the remedies. Yeah, I wonder if you could um, just go into it a little bit for the audience, like what you mean about this shift uh, from when you were practicing to this more administrative role. Um, Sure, sure. Uh, the city of Chicago wanted to be able to prosecute or pursue code violation corrections and uh, needed a way to be able to handle thousands and thousands of cases. And they did so with the enactment of administrative rules uh, back in the, I'd say, a good 20, 25 years as well. Uh, that, that since that time we have been handling many of our cases administratively. Only a rare select number of uh, building cases get referred to the housing court system. And there's a tendency to take too many uh, continuances be to, uh, rather than getting the repairs done quickly and some small fine imposed, we're seeing cases that will run for a year, year and a half, two years. And that uh, has uh, created a problem because it's delayed justice and delayed the repairs for the protections of the residents and the neighbors. I, I'm wondering if, sorry, Madison, um, I'm wondering if there's anything you can share um, from your perspective about why that change came about. Well, some of this is speculative, but uh, the observation was simply that we had to be able to cover more ground. We were doing 
to some extent less cases, but we were getting the, the phrase full compliance. Each of the code violation cases that were being dismissed were being dismissed more rapidly because there was more pressure put on the landlord to make the repairs quickly. And as a result, in return, we would do a settlement, come to a settlement agreement with an amount of a fine uh, that was uh, uh, not punitive in nature, but it was intended to cover the cost of the litigation. Because as you can guess, to get an army of attorneys to handle these cases is an expensive process. But uh, the courthouse used to run on the 11th floor of the Daily Center with six courtrooms running full speed every day, handling all types of cases, lead paint poisoning, you mentioned fire prevention, uh, building repair, construction, uh, electrical wiring problems, things across the gamut of uh, building uh, components. And there was the commitment to, of the funds and the manpower to do that. But as the city started to seek ways to reduce its costs and to uh, uh, control the budget, the building department was one of the places that uh, took hits over the years. And uh, that has had, I think, a negative effect on what happens in the communities. Thank you. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really interesting point in giving the historical context there of how things have changed and with the idea to bring be more efficient. And one thing that we found really interesting when we were reporting out of this though is that, you know, regardless of the resources and how many people we actually have out there doing the job, we found there was very little rules about how this job should be done, which, you know, whether it goes to administrative hearing or it goes to court or whatever it is. And that could obviously lead to a lot of equity issues, you know, like what we've seen here. We've seen the vast majority of people who died in these fires were non-white. We found that a lot of serious violations on the south and west sides are never marked as resolved by the city. And I'm wondering if, you know, to any of you really, what value you think we could find from either you know, creating strict rules about if the inspector finds a certain issue, this is what needs to happen, or if that would be problematic in its own way, because you know, what the city would say is that every case is unique and they need to be able to answer, answer complaints and respond to issues holistically. Um, so you know, what would be any of your take? Well, uh, I, I, forgive me, but I am an old dinosaur, and, and uh, to that extent, I'm, I'm reliving past history of the way that uh, the city's uh, enforcement, code enforcement process has evolved. But um, it, when I started uh, 28 years, uh, somewhere in that ballpark ago, <laughs> uh, we would uh, man up with each of uh, each prosecutor meeting the landlord directly and uh, between that interaction between the two and their attorneys that were representing them, we would come to agreements as to what items had to be completed at the earliest opportunity. And then uh, by doing so, you would focus on the things that would be a greater hazard to the tenants at large. Nowadays, we process paper and uh, the administrative process over at Department of Administrative Hearings is uh, really a, a self-defeating system to an extent because all we do is we, we push our cases through the system, we impose some substantial fines, and then there's a question of whether the landlord can pay the fine, none of the money being committed to the actual repair. In prior uh, years, we would uh, reduce the penalties and the fines to cover the cost of having filed the litigation and having had an attorney uh, represent the city at the proceedings in the housing court system. But housing court doesn't, uh, 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 the judiciary don't appreciate having these types of cases there. They're, they're not very uh, uh, stylish or interesting, if you guess, but when it comes to the lives that are behind them, it, it certainly does have an impact. Eric, I saw you wanting to speak. 
I am trying. I mean, I understand Mark is giving information and thank him for it. But the more I hear, the more I just hear, oh, well, it costs money to do that. We don't have money to spend on the poor. If it was a lucrative, I mean, if it was a system that made the city money, maybe it would get more attention. But right now, we're like he said, court cases are dragging out in court and people are dying. And we're saying that there's, you know, no money for it. We don't have money because of budget. And what what do those lives cost? Is that life cost more than that money? I mean, I've I've not heard City Hall ask Springfield or the state of Illinois for extra money for building housing in my life. So with that being said, right. I could be wrong, but with that being said, it's like, wow, my child died in those fires. There is too much, you know. Nobody really cares down at the buildings department, I'm guessing. I mean, it's just, you know, paper pushers because nothing has feeling about it. Nothing takes into, a, into account the families that are suffering from this. You know, it's like, okay, we'll, the city of Chicago will never let their permit process go like that because that's a lucrative system. But we're just gonna let the, um, you know, we're just gonna let the, uh, you know, the slum lords get away because it costs us money to inspect their buildings. I mean, if that's the case, how about training residents? We need to do something. We're doing nothing and that's what's upsetting. It's like we could train the residents to go through the building themselves. But at this point, we're not doing anything. I don't have all the answers. I will never claim to, but we need to try. And we are not trying period, as far as I'm concerned from City Hall. When I made the ordinance, Alderman Bill made a comment that I found funny at the time, but I understand it now. He said, I'm tired of coming to city council, redoing these ordinances for building and fire safety. And yet I look up four years later and they're right back at the table trying to redo something. I mean, that, if it was holes in it, you couldn't address the holes that are in it and go from there. If we keep restarting from zero, where do we, we'll never get progress. And it's, it's very upsetting me. It is. And, you know, one thing I'll point out, too, is that I found rather surprising is when we went to Department of Buildings, you know, currently, and obviously, you know, Mark, you've been with them for a few years, uh, we were with the, uh, they do not point to a lack of resources as a problem. When I think that it's pretty obvious to anyone on the outside that, of course, that's an issue. Of course, you know, most government problems could utilize more funds and more resources. And so I think that there's also an answer of, um, or question of where is the political will here to do something? Um, you know, what is the issue of not asking for more funds or for, um, or is it just that we need to, you know, utilize our resources differently? Um, you know, we're not the only city in the world to have budget issues. Um, but, you know, we only have a couple minutes left and Greg, I do want to go back to you a little bit here to, Get, get your take on all of this, you know, um, particularly that with uh, enforcement in, you know, if we're going to be doing this program, we're not going to be moving to proactive, say we're doing complaint based. How can we make the most of the resources that we have? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think you've all hit on some good points. I think the equity issues are clear when you're relying on a complaint based system. We just know that, uh, you know, for instance, uh, if you look up a lot of the slumlord litigation that happens across the country, you'll, you'll see actually that a lot of them, it'll be brought by the cities and a lot of those properties will never have had a single complaint registered against them because sort of the power dynamic right between the landlord and the tenants is so drastic, right? The tenants either need to be in housing, they are, they're fearful of landlord retaliation, it's the only housing they can afford, it's, um, you know, maybe they're undocumented and they don't want to interact with, with government. So it, it's always going to be an equity issue as long as we're relying on complaint-based system. Because the other thing is we know that the people who have privilege are the ones who feel most entitled to file complaints, right? So, you know, I used to work in, with cities and we'd get, you know, noise complaints and all mm -hmm. sorts of other things that are going to come in through your 311 system. And they were, you know, if you just mapped where are the complaints are coming from, and the frequency, you know, a lot of that would have been in our more, you know, nicer neighborhoods, uh, you know, whiter neighborhoods. And that's because they were using the system. Either they 
they knew what the system was, they knew that they could access it and they felt entitled to. And that's just not something that can be said for, for all of our, our populations. And, and so it's a, it's a real challenge of systemically, right, for uh, relying on a complaint-based system. The, uh, the other thing though, that you, know, you guys mentioned is money and it, it is tough to fund these types of programs. And you know, Chicago's not alone in having budget cuts to building, you know, specifically across the country. I, I think it's a it's a department, you know, a municipal service that gets kind of slashed at the back end a lot uh, when budget talks are going through. Um, but there are ways that you can could probably shape the the funding or the the fines and fee structure uh, of these to further incentivize. Uh, the city to to pursue um, these actions fully. Uh, again, it's really tough without sort of having a revenue stream up front where you're registering landlords and they're paying you to be on the list to sort of front this money. Um, but there are ways to to try to tie the enforcement action uh, enforcement actions to remedying the property values as as Mark was talking about that they would sort of negotiate into their you know, settlements and there's things that like that that need to be sort of accounted for within all the, the fines and fee structures. Um, you know, the, the worst thing is when we, you know, get those uh, extensions and it's, you know, it's enforcement that never actually happens. A lot of those types of things that get extended and extended ultimately get dropped. Uh, and that's a, that's a game that gets played. So flipping the penalty structure to tying it to something like, hey, we're going to uh, put a lien on your property or we're going to prevent you from selling your property or we're gonna prevent you from renting your property because you know, you, we're gonna require you to get a, a license from us. Like those are the other mechanisms that will compel compliance beyond just um, you know, finding people. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a minute before we can head into our Q&A, but I did want to pose um, a similar question that we asked Mark to Eric uh, from, you know, from a tenant's perspective, like what, what do you think would make the most difference um, in people's lives if, if, it were, if it was enacted, you know, tomorrow or in the next couple of days? Like, what is the one thing that you think could really make a difference? I'll say, again, the biggest thing that would make a difference is enforcement. And at the end of the day in Chicago, we have so many different agencies. Everybody's a city employee. I see so many police cars sitting unused, doing nothing. If they're out of service for a minute, let them go do it. Let a fight, a down, a, 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 matter of fact, we have a lot of suspended officers and everything else that's under disciplinary review. They could be used for that. There's a million ideas we could come up with to use actual already paid city employees to do this job. It's just you have to have the passion for it. And unfortunately, until it's one of those issues that until it affects you personally, it's not something you're passionate about. If I could respond. Sure. Uh, uh, one thing I would like to say, uh, uh, while it was an antiquated system, we would literally find people in contempt of court for violating an order to make the repairs. And we would lock people up. And nothing <laughs> focuses the mind of a landlord than recognizing that uh, they may end up in, in jail for a couple of days until the work gets done. Obviously, it's not something that you impose lightly. Uh, it is you know, considered very draconian, but nothing uh, ever seemed to beat that, even beyond the fines that might have been imposed. The fact that somebody might be marching into the hands of the, the deputy sheriff to serve a sentence of a period of time until a repair is made to ensure that things got done and got done quickly. And if I could hop in super quick, I just wanted to to say, I agree with this enforcement aspect. Um, and one of the things that I think we've actually seen happen in places that have moved to a more proactive system is they're not getting rid of their, their responsive 
code enforcement. They're not getting rid of complaint-based filings. Those, there's always a place for that. But what it has often done is let cities sort of raise the general level of housing in their community and lets them prioritize their actual code enforcement efforts against um, the worst offenders. So for instance, Boston has a sort of two-part code enforcement. They have one set of code enforcement officers that go out and check all the rental properties every you know, three to five years, and that's all they do. And they have a separate task force that is reserved for serious violations. And they, get, they have the time and ability to really do what Mark's saying, which is sort of provide that individual attention to make sure that the worst offenders are, are actually responsive in, in doing something. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so we'll be officially moving into our Q&A section. Um, and we have an interesting question about um, how the vast majority of buildings aren't who end up uh, in some enforcement proceedings are not slumlords um, in the way that we would think about them, but they may be small um, or owned by mom and pop landlords who may not have resources. So I guess one of the questions here is, should there be different penalties for small landlords compared to big ones? Yes. Yes. I actually agree. Yes. I am in agreement as well. I think that resources are different and, you know, oftentimes where we're seeing, you know, this is one of those cases where having more data would be helpful, but what we've seen from most of the cities that do have proactive programs is that the small property owners are not the ones who are responsible for the worst violations. It, it tends to be larger out of town absentee landlords um, who are owning, you know, in many, in many cases, sort of larger mid-sized to larger multifamilies. And, you know, that does beg the question though, is how would you determine that? How would you de determine, um, you know, who is the small landlord and, you know, if they are a small landlord who really doesn't have the financial means to, uh, to go to court, to do the repairs. Um, I think that's, you know, probably what the city would argue is why they allow a lot of this leeway, um, which obviously has its upsides and downsides. You know, Mark, from your experience, how would you have figured out that, those questions? Well, uh, most of the, the uh, landlords are, are not slumlords, obviously. Sometimes they just need a little bit of help or a little bit of redirection and, and, and a threat to uh, be compelled to impose a fine to make a remedy of a, a condition that's uh, uh, unsafe for the residents in, in, of their properties. But the vast majority of people, I, I think, want to do the right thing, but the costs are so expensive and uh, the building process to get permits for the repairs that have to be made to take a period of time. These types of delays slow things down. The other piece of the puzzle is the administrative hearings process where uh, uh, it was affectionately known as a, a cash box, uh, where is a, instead of pursuing the, the primary goal, which is to have the landlord make the repairs that are necessary and do that quickly, we would uh, be more uh, in debate of how much fine should be imposed and what the per diems would be of the penalties imposed. I think that to some extent, the administrative hearings process is, uh, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Um, I, I see this question popped up in the Q&A. Was that administrative process a mistake? Uh, there, you've, you've caught me flat-footed. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say it's a mistake. It has its, its role as a tool for enforcement, but nothing really beats seeing a prosecutor in front of the bench with the landlord discussing what has to be done and what should be repaired first and how quickly. Those types of things are a, a sort of a come to Jesus moment where, where you have to really recognize the need to step up. The administrative hearings process is, is a lot of paper transferring from, you know, passing from part to part 
And the impetus is to impose a fine no matter what happens and, and if it's not done by the first date, some financial bloodletting is going to occur against the landlord. And it, be, it becomes a situation in my mind where that is more important than the, the goal, which is to get the buildings fixed. I'm sorry if I cut you short. No, no fine. Um, you know, something we're seeing another question here. Um, someone, uh, Bridget, is asking, Eric was mentioning three one complaints in police. Um, is there any escalation system in place where a tenant can call 311 after they have numerous unanswered 311 complaints? Or sorry, call 911 after numerous unanswered 311 complaints. And you know, I can answer that that we don't have something like that right now. Um, so I'm curious if, if you all think that that would be a useful thing and maybe also coupling that with another question we received of what uh, what do tenants do? What in your all of your experience you've seen tenants do in situations when their complaints are not being answered? Well, as far as complaints not being answered, tenants basically are limited on what they can do. I got a call from my child's mother today who lives in CHA. Her wall and ceiling is leaking water onto her fuse box. She's called CHA all day. She's called 311. And I'm almost at the point of telling her to call 911 because that is a big danger. She's called her management company. No one has came. It's been six hours already. Now, if the, and also then I had to check the smoke detector. It's electronically wired. It's malfunctioned due to the water getting in the speaker. So she's basically in complete danger right now with no one to call in a city housing authority building. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious um, in a situation like that or in situations like that, which do happen, like what do you think would be people's recourse? Uh, Mark maybe or Greg or whoever wants to jump in. Well, uh, there are certain types of violations that are an imminent threat to health and safety. And that should usually result in a phone call to the Department of Buildings to uh, register the, the condition. And uh, if the manpower is there, and I, I, I wonder to what extent that it is these days, the, the uh, building department personnel would generally triage the cases and find out what was the the most urgent item and then pursue those particular uh, uh, conditions first. Uh, but the question is how much manpower is there to get this done? We can generate a lot of paper. The building department can generate a massive amount of paper, uh, but then it's parceled to the administrative hearings process and some of it, a smaller portion is parceled to the housing court system. We have to rebuild the housing court system and have it become the tool to uh, better housing uh, uh, that it was many years ago. It's a costly process and that's why it was abandoned for the administrative procedure. But uh, uh, it was the best way to get eyes on eyes uh, uh, to uh, have that come to Jesus meeting and have the, the landlord or the management company recognize the need to get this done and get it done quickly. Yeah, I'll just hop in here real quick as well and say that I think, um, well, there, there's a couple of items. One with regards to sort of escalating the, the responsibilities. You know, I don't know what the 311 system in Chicago fully encompasses and how many different types of complaints that encompasses. Um, I know in other areas, uh, you know, 311 might include potholes and other types of, um, you know, civic complaints. That's just getting lost in the noise, right? So if you don't have a dedicated housing complaint system uh, and, it, and you're having housing complaints shuffled in with all the other sort of communications that are going to the city, that's obviously going to cause delays and you know risks someone not being able to elevate life in them uh, emergencies to the necessary response protocols that a city should have because in law uh, you know almost all states will have some sort of law around uh, necessary measures a city can take uh, to try to protect um, you know residents who are at imminent risk due to unsafe structures it's a lot part of a lot of building codes and housing codes. Um, 
so I, I think there's a there is a sort of a network issue here about you know where are the complaints going and who's seeing them and how quickly can they actually be addressed or responded to. Um, the other thing I was going to make mention of is that this is where it's really important to think about what are the broader you know ordinances or tenant protections do we have because um, in some situations right ten, you know as Eric mentioned tenants don't have you know they don't have the financial resources to make the repairs they don't have the you know the ability to do it and you know they can't do it fast enough um, but you know in which case they probably have to leave you know and we need to be able to have laws and policies and practices in place that rehouse those people for the amount of time necessary until their housing is is repaired to a habitable condition um, and I don't know the specifics of the laws in Chicago but those are really important laws and you know we need to be able to take a situation that Eric mentioned and get those people into new housing until 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 their housing safe. Um, and I'll just make one last sort of aside here, and that's what we call rent escrow programs. And we were talking a little bit about the challenge of funding the repairs. And um, you know, one of the options for doing that is to let tenants redirect their rent payments into a account that gets administered for landlords that they can only access to repair their house after which they get their money back and they get any rent <clears throat> above and beyond their amount of the repair, you know, back from the, the tenants after that. So, um, you know, there's different ways those work, but uh, that, that, that's, there are policies out there and ways to do this. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a question from the MTO, the Metropolitan Tenants Organization, how do we encourage city officials and the Department of Buildings to move from a complaint-based system and push a proactive rental inspection system, particularly in Black and Indigenous um, or, or areas where people of color live? The burden falls unfairly on the tenants. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. I, I mean, I think it's been a big challenge in a lot of places for people to to do this. And because, you know, um, one of the questions you've asked me beforehand are what are the pros and cons of proactive code enforcement programs? And there's a lot of pros and there's really only kind of one con and the con tends to be, you know, the, the cost of administering these programs. And it it's a reflection of the fact that code enforcement has been sort of defunded a lot anyways. So getting it up to where it should be is, you know, already a cost and then setting up something that goes above and beyond that is, is probably an, an additional cost. But we're talking about ultimately uh, the places that have been successful have really framed this in terms of health and safety for residents. And I think the the equity issues are a really strong reason why we've seen some movement in the past three years. I'd say, you know, a lot of these programs popped up in like the sort of late 2000s, uh, sort of there's a, a first round of cities that sort of pursued this. And there's been more recent movement on it again in the last couple, you know, two to three years. And a lot of it's been around the equity, you know, it's been around the fact that the um, the, the populations that are at the highest risk and, and live in some of the lowest quality housing are the ones who are least likely to utilize the complaint-based system. Uh, and there, and there's a lot of exposures. So, you know, whether it's lead poisoning and the long-term chronic effects that has on uh, children's health to fire safety or slip and falls or asthma, which is a huge, uh, you know, asthma triggers um, are a huge health problem. I think these have been the compelling reasons, you know, that advocates have utilized to say, hey, our, you know, our community is really suffering and, and it shouldn't be. And it's a role of government to provide this necessary service to ensure our health. I agree. It, it seems that we can do more uh, uh, by being a, a little bit more aggressive as to our inspection process and commitment of the manpower that's necessary to cover the city of Chicago. Uh, the city is, is always tapping on new 
uh, uh, protocols, a new, uh, uh, we've adopted a new code. We've upgraded our code to the international, the building code standards. And uh, while these are positive things, it leaves these poor landlords and uh, the poor communities in, in uh, it moves them titularly as, as uh, violators because the new codes have become more aggressive as to what has to be done. And uh, this is a, uh, an expensive process. It's, it's not cheap to make the repairs that are necessary with the codes, uh, but uh, we have to commit the resources to getting this done. City Hall, I think, uh, has a tough budget and uh, you know for for all of her uh, skills you know uh, the mayor has mayor Lightfoot has a lot on her plate but uh, we I think it's time for the city council and the members of the, of the city council to sit down and start having discussions with how to make the system more proactive and uh, as opposed to reactive I just wanted to hop back in one more time because this is sort of a, a thing I like talking about. But I want to say there, there's beyond the the justice orientation that I talked about earlier, which I you know which is the moral obligation that the city should have to protect their residents. There is even like a financial incentive here uh, for cities to pursue this. It, it's a bit of a longer term play, but these types of programs can help offset city expenditures and lots of other areas, right? So um, enforcing, having good code enforcement is part of a homelessness prevention strategy. Why is that? Because it's helping maintain existing housing stock that doesn't deteriorate, that doesn't cause people to have health conditions that causes them to lose their, their job or to, to become homeless or forces them out of their existing home. And how much do we spend on homelessness prevention programs? And yeah. it's all of the other health programs that that the city is providing to residents. You know, how the ensuring this is one of the ways that we ensure healthy and, and habitable housing. And the more we can do that, the more we're going to be saving in in other areas. And it's not even just that. You know, we also have the tax revenue standpoint, right? Because these types of programs help prevent the deterioration of community property values. Uh, so we're saving tax revenue by making sure that we are, you know, keeping houses up to a certain standard. And in doing so, you know, we're helping, you know, save the city's, um, yeah, general fund. Um, so there's a lot of incentives. And, and the last one I'll just mention again is the having the knowledge base around what your community is and what your rental housing stock is just makes for smarter, more targeted investments um, that can, you know, from if you're doing a, a neighborhood plan or trying to do targeted investment in, in certain areas, um, you know, it, it helps do that in a much better way. Uh, so any of the redevelopment work that the city is doing can be done much smarter if they actually know what the housing stock looks like in the communities that they're trying to redevelop. And one of the opportunities that we, we've really not taken advantage of is the opportunity to use prehab, uh, I'm sorry, prefab uh, housing. Uh, the city of Chicago has explored, put, put, dipped its toes in the waters over the years that I've seen, but never really adopted a process that would uh, take down the buildings that we have that are, are best uh, bulldozed and uh, renewed with new homes that are uh, uh, more positive for the residents to build our communities back up by doing so. Interesting, you know, we've been, um, you know, trying to summarize kind of a lot of the questions we've been getting has been around, you know, well, what can we do? And we talked a lot about, you know, some of the specifics the city government could take, but what do you all think that, you know, we as a general public um, as citizens, people, you know, advocates, whoever is attending this, what can they do to push for some change here to see some improvement? How, how would you all see that materializing and what sort of impact do you think it could have? Well, that's one place that I believe the list actually was working a little bit at, as well as I hope, wish the color coder would have came with it, but the ordinance list, the bad landlord list helps with that because if I see that there is a property on my block. I may not know the landlord, know nothing about this landlord, but if I see that there's a property on my block and is driving down my property value, 
I believe I'm going to be a little bit more more pushed to talk to my alderman about getting something done as opposed to this person just sliding back because nobody knows. So I it's more about sharing the information we have, which for some reason in Chicago, we don't want to share that information. Sharing the information is what's going to provide us with, you know, knowing, like if you look on the landlord list, when I first looked at that list, a lot of the landlords were multiple building owners. Same landlord, four or five buildings all on the list. So we're hiding the worst landlords by not printing the list or not putting anything to show the neighborhood what's going on inside of the building and going away from the uh, complaint-based system, I believe is gonna get much worse. To some extent, the process has been uh, uh, what is referred to gently as a snitch court where neighbors call in neighbors and uh, uh, complain about a particular building on a block. You have to be proactive. You have to actually beat that drum. You have to keep singing out over and over again about a particular problem or a particular block that has uh, uh, deterioration that's uh, a threat to the residents. You, can, you, you have to do that. You can't just take this uh, politely. You have to challenge it. And gentlemen here have lost a, a child. But, you know, unfortunately, it, it takes certain events such as that to really uh, stoke the fires and getting people more responsible to, to get involved in the process. Our aldermen play the key part here and uh, they have to speak up, I think, more aggressively when there are bad the buildings within their communities. They really do. Also, there's a flip side of that, Mark, is in most neighborhoods, well, the neighborhood on the south side where I live, out well, not outside of my area, because I'm in Bronzeville, which has basically been mostly owners now, but at one time it was all renters. We don't see the property value falling because of that building. So a renter doesn't know anything about what that building's doing to that block. Yeah. Understood. And if you, you know, so that renter is not going to call. Now, a landlord may see his property value, see this building and know that's what's going on, but a renter doesn't know that. So a renter in most situations wouldn't call unless they could actually see a problem they knew to be a problem. Well, I, the, the one thing that I would note is that uh, whether it's in, in public housing, private housing, affordable housing, uh, existing uh, rehabilitation projects, things of that nature. All the history uh, uh, that passed this prologue, all these things have occurred and bounced back into our lap each time without ever necessarily uh, getting the bull by the horns. Uh, people are going to keep uh, uh, dying or, or, or being injured in substandard housing if we don't get more aggressive with our enforcement and inspectional processes. And that means we have to put the, the manpower that is necessary uh, towards the inspectional process in order to make sure that we're, we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's and making a better, safer community. We really have to do something differently. Agree. So I was just going to chime in and, and, you know, to the question of sort of, well, what can, you know, we, the audience do? And I think um, to me, there, there's sort of a, a few things. One is just to keep talking about it. Um, it it's really unfortunate that I, I really appreciate the story and investigation you all have done. And it's, it's really unfortunate that there seems to be a cycle of attention that gets paid to disasters um, that, that spurs a little bit of action, but, but not long-term action. And so I think one of the, the ways to do, to continue to, to put pressure on folks is to try to, to marry the, the conversation around these disasters and, and the, the tragedies that are impacting us with the, the ongoing sort of daily, you know, um, challenges that people are facing in their substandard housing and you know it's not just that there are these you know fire events but you know people are being poisoned daily in their housing people are 
uh, you know, developing long, lifelong chronic health conditions daily. They're being exposed to toxic molds and pests mm -hmm. and other things. And so, you know, I think you have, you have to expand that conversation. And I just wanted to sort of get to you build on that to say, you know, I think it's really important to broaden the tent. Um, in our world, we've seen um, that housing advocates even can be siloed, right? And that there are folks who are, are focused on housing um, quality uh, and there are folks that are housed, focused on housing affordability or anti-gentrification. And, you know, in my book, they all play into each other. If we don't have maintain our housing stock in a reasonable manner, we lose the natural affordable housing that we have and we have an affordable housing problem. And if we don't do it, then people are getting sick and are being forced to move out of their houses. And so it doesn't matter if, you know, uh, you know to get to that sort of displacement or gentrification challenge, people are getting gonna be sort of displaced regardless of the investment that goes into that property if the property's, you know, killing or hurting people. So the housing challenges are all interrelated. And I think the more we try to pursue this and, and broaden the tent in terms of who the advocates are, who are who see why this is an important thing to them and their values, the the more people we can get into meetings and the, the more likely we are to succeed in, in pushing something through. Definitely. Well, um, we're still gonna have some time for some final thoughts here, but I think we're gonna bring it back to Olivia now. She's gonna have a, a couple words on this. Hey, thanks you guys. Um, thank you so much for that conversation. And thanks to everyone who's been watching uh, and commenting in the Q&A um, and in the Facebook live chat. Um, if you don't have, uh, if you didn't get your ans questions answered, um, we do have a survey which is in the chat of the Zoom and also in the chat for the Facebook Live that you can um, take and share your questions there. Um, but before I wrap up officially, um, I just wanna get it, take it back to Madison and Cecilia and the panel. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts and you know what should people take away from this investigation and the issues that were reported in it. I, I can start off with that. Um, I, I just want to say, you know, I I think a lot of what Greg was just mentioning is so on point in that while our project was focused on fire safety, we're really talking about overall safety issues here where people can be hurt or injured or otherwise impacted in a negative way from what they live in. And so if this is something that you're interested in, you care about, I encourage you to keep having these conversations, you know, reach out to your alderman, learn more about it, um, because it's such a widespread issue and it's, it's so important. Eric, do you have any, any last thoughts you want to share? I'd like to, I mean, you know, like, i like to thank Greg and Mark. I mean, I've got great insight from you guys. I mean, it's just, again, like you, we were talking about the uh, city budgeting, we not having uh, basically being monetary problems. I believe we basically need to reprioritize our spending because we just took FEMA funds we spent on overtime for police and everybody else. That's part of safety. We're just redirecting it to where we want it. Police is safety, fire is safety. So that money that they took from the Fed could have been used for the buildings department as well, because that should all be under the same umbrella to my thought anyway. And until we redirect our spending habits, we'll continue to have this problem. We're right now planning a 78th district in Chicago when we can't keep the building safe in the other 77. Well, we, we've, if I can uh, mention, we, we have 50 aldermen there are there are, are plenty of eyes on the the field, and there's uh, uh, a lot of awareness as to what the conditions are within each of our communities. But until we start lo looking at 
these problems holistically and going after the landlords more aggressively as necessary. And uh, as long as we can update our uh, building codes, uh, we've adopted the new, uh, you know, uh, international building code, and that's a great step forward. But we've still got a long way to go. We, we've uh, codified what we want to do, but now we have to make it happen. And that involves both the building department, the, the finance department, the, uh, the uh, Fire Prevention Bureau, uh, the various entities around the city of Chicago. We all have to start pulling in the same direction and get aggressive about the types of repairs that we want to make here. Yeah, uh, I would just end by saying, I think there's an opportunity here. I, I think that this story is well-timed. Um, there's a lot of money coming out of the federal government right now. A lot of it's housing money uh, and the infrastructure bill and, and some of the emergency funds. And there's flexibility with how that can be used. So there is an opportunity here to try to experiment with different um, processes to try to redirect that funding, as Eric's saying, to um, make the argument, say, we need better housing code because that's going to help us, uh, you know, in our rental, you know, emergency rental housing um, situation. So I think there's a real opportunity. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just close on is to say that, um, you know, I know I've been talking a lot about proactive code enforcement. Um, and I know Eric's been talking a lot about the need to really, you know, enforce against the you know worst violators. And I just want to say I don't think that those are mutually exclusive. I think those are both things that the city should pursue, and that the city can pursue simultaneously. There are sound like there are um, some small reforms that could be made to, you know, reprioritize what's going on right now, as well as an opportunity to start moving. And utilizing some of those, like you know, the, the federal funds and the, the federal opportunities to start standing up something that might be more proactive. But the the point is that we want to not confuse the two. There is a, a role in city government to go after the worst offenders, and then there's another role to try to raise the floor and improve housing for everyone. Uh, and it's easy, and cities have you know, in my experience, conflated the two, and it ends up being that they don't do either well. Um, you know, the policies should be, and, and the practice should be targeted towards those two individual goals. And, um, you know, I, I really do think that there's uh, a role to play in, in, you know, either going back to the system that Mark was working within, um, or finding some other reforms similar to the, the legislation Eric's been proposing um, to try to, to fix um, both of those challenges. Um, I, I will just add very quickly here before we close that uh, Madison and I are still very much interested in this topic. And if there's you know something you wanna tell us, anything you wanna share, question you didn't get to ask and you'd like for us to um, speak with you directly, doesn't have to be for a story, um, we're, we're both here. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, this was a very uh, important conversation, an important investigation. Um, and we thank you guys, um, particularly Greg Miao, um, Eric Pan Smith uh, and Mark Lamani for joining uh, Madison and Cecilia tonight. Um, so just another round of thanks to everyone participating tonight. Thank you again to everyone that's been watching. Um, and most importantly, we wanna thank, um, I think on the point of Cecilia's um, uh, mention um, of being available and wanting to connect with community members directly um, we couldn't have done this project, this investigation, without so many people who spent time with Madison and Cecilia um, over the last year and plus. Um, they share their memories about loved ones who died in the fatal fires um, and just their experiences and were vulnerable um, in providing us, all of us, this information that hopefully um, can, you know, perhaps grow into change. So. I want to thank you guys again so much for being with us. We do have another event coming up 
Uh, it's related to the failures before the fires investigation. It's going to be an in invitation only uh, program for individuals who live in Chicago neighborhoods most affected by these fatal fires. So this will be a solutions based, resource based, um, and dialogue space for um, folks in these communities that um, were in the reporting and you know that have direct impact from uh, these fatal fires. So if you're interested in learning more about this event, um, uh, learning more about the investigation, have any questions uh, that are lingering, uh, or have any ideas as how we can improve on our events, both Chicago Tribune and the BGA, please take our survey. We have added that to the link to the chat of um, the Zoom and also the Facebook Live. And we hope to share some of the takeaways um, from the event with you all. So please subscribe to the Better Government Association and the Chicago Tr Tribune for updates. And again, this uh, rec this video, this um, sorry, this conversation is being recorded. So mm -hmm. later this week we'll have it uploaded and it will have uh, Spanish subtitles. So um, please be on the lookout for that. Thank you again, everyone, and I hope you all have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.